Recording in progress. All right, I think that means we're good. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to episode four. I'm still a little, I'm still sick. I don't know if I was sick last episode, but I am now. And that's why the slides were late. Yep. It's that time of year. Yeah, it's that time of year. Um, I got a COVID test earlier today. Oh. It was great. It's like the they they did the, it wasn't like the rapid tests fit one it was the one where they like tickle like they feel your brain up. What the oh yeah. And my then, um my uncle tested positive for COVID uh maybe a few days ago. Ooh. He is a fervent Republican. Okay. He lives in Iowa. Oh. Known Iowa? Trump supporter. Okay. Is he vaccinated? He was not. Uh oh. He, well, they think it's the regular one, and but he's on oxygen, oh. double but he says he's feeling better on oxygen. Okay, so he's not intubated; he's just on oxygen. Yeah. Okay. That's if he's not intubated. Yeah. G generally, if if someone's intubated, it's like kind of like, uh, but if they've just needed supplemental oxygen, like they they'll, they'll be okay, I guess. He's a pretty healthy guy, middle yeah. age. Hopefully everything goes okay with that. How, how's school? School is school, and work is work, you know? That, that's how it goes. We're headed into the um, kind of depressing fall season. I had my first day where I woke up, and I'm like, God, it's cold. I don't want to get up. Oh, yeah, seasonal depression kicking in. Mark your calendars. Yeah, it's not the, the daylight. It's just it being cold that does it for me. I don't... This is the part of the season where I am like... I'm aware of winter's presence. That's right. And then, I always forget yeah. how long winter is because summer doesn't feel like long. It just long. feels like a state of mind. Yeah. Winter feels like something you're fighting through. Yeah. From November to February, it feels like you're actively fighting against the weather. And that's why I don't want any part of it. But where we're going, we don't have winters because we're going to the lovely Central Valley for intro to Golden State Water Policy of California. Where we will finally answer the question, is growing food wasting water? But first, a, a little piece of um, relevant news. The KMP complex, General Sherman's last question mark stand. So this is the KMP complex fire in Sequoia National Park. Uh, this is the San Francisco Chronicles uh, wildfire map. They do a good job. So Sequoia National Park here. Uh, there's Los Angeles down there. There's San Jose here, and there's Fresno, the lovely armpit of the Central Valley, where you can see some kid eating a fire hydrant on a street corner. Hmm. But this tree right here is General Sherman, which is the largest giant sequoia tree and pretty much the largest organism in the world. It's over 3,000 years old, and they currently have the base wrapped in tinfoil. So Sequoia National Park has a like a really healthy history of controlled burns so wildfires there aren't usually that out of control but last year the castle fire killed 10 percent of all giant sequoias in the world they're they're really not supposed to die are they no they're adapted to a f certain type of fire but a low severity fire yeah it's like um acacia seeds are also gener um generally adapted to that they uh they need a fire in order to become ready to root the main cause of death for sequoias sh like should be tipping over in high winds yeah um yeah like you'll see a bunch of, like a huge stumps so of just like epic falls over but that's how they should die it shouldn't really be dying from crown fires because the crown of the tree is super high up for a reason but yeah, just a little interesting piece of news. As you can see, under containment, it's at 0%. So Sequoia mm. Kings Canyon National Park, they're choosing to um, let that function as a controlled burn. So they could go and contain it if they wanted to, but for the health of the forest, they're letting it burn. Wildfires aren't all bad, folks. Yeah, they're necessary for the ecosystem. It's they just are. the big ones that get a little bad. Yeah, the big ones. They aren't so good, but... We must ask ourselves, what is a California? What is a California? Okay, so 
according to um, Reddit and Fox News, it has traffic, homeless poop, and what else? Syringes. Syringes. Someone saying they got me fucked up outside in H and M. You're confusing that with Philadelphia. I can't tell the difference anymore. I need to go back. But if there's one thing that California has besides, um, well, no longer Joe Rogan, no longer Elon Musk, and no longer one congressional district. <laughs> the home of going somewhere else. This is, this is kind of true, but first, let's get into geographic diversity and climate. So, I'm sure you've heard people say that you can go skiing and um, surfing in the same day, which isn't much of an accomplishment, depending on how comfortable you want to be doing either thing. <laughs> so, like, I could, I could go surfing on Lake Michigan in February, and then take an hour and a half drive over to Wilmot Mountain. And I'd still be skiing and surfing on the same day, but I wouldn't be comfortable doing either one. Yeah. But I'm sure what they mean is, of course, you know, Tahoe, Santa Cruz. Um, but anyway, a lot of different climates. You have the Sierra Nevadas here, and Northern Sierra, and Mount Shasta. And you have the Central Valley. Oh, shit. I'm sorry. But can you tell us anything about Koppen climate types, uh, apes, man? <laughs> yep, AP Environmental Science. Koppen climate types measure not only the type of climate, but also its relation to, you know, various different things. So, whereas, let's say, the hardiness meter measures only annual extreme minimum temperature, Koppen climate types are a blend of many different factors. And... I believe here we are something like um we're the same as Poland, I believe. Oh boy, I feel a lot better. Uh DFA. In, in terms of population. So DFA is standing for down fucking atrocious. <laughs> yeah, humid continental. So mostly around the polar front in North America and Europe. Oh boy. So, besides climate types, anything else you want to say about the climate types? Um, you know, generally there's certain things you can predict from them. Annual rainfall and annual high and low temperature being mostly them. But, you know, depending on what you're looking at, you can also say, you know, this is a tropical climate. Maybe the soil isn't going to be as good. Looking at the rainforest, this is a desert climate. Maybe there is going to be no soil. Because there is no water. But soil erosion is a real thing, so and it is erosion, bad. It, it's not good. But the other thing that um, is not good is rainfall right here. Well, kind of good. But this map's a little dated, um, made on data from 1961 to 1990. The numbers are going to be... The map is going to be relatively the same, but the, these numbers are going to be a bit lower. Um, so, vast, vast differences in rainfall. So, you have Del Delmarda County up here with, you know, over 120 or a lot of rain. Go when I was biking through this, it was just wet all the time. Like, I'd wake up and all of my stuff would be wet. I'd have to, like, wipe off my bike in the morning. The Oregon experiment. It was the Oregon experiment. Like, we were still in Oregon, but, like, there were less Trump 2028 flags. Oof. Ugh, yeah, the bad touch. Yeah, uh, your boy is going to be, like, 90 by that time. <laughs> anyway. And then, you know, Central Coast, uh, you're still having pretty high rainfall, but for, and most of the coast in general. But the more inland you go, especially in the south, it's just pretty much all desert down here. You have pretty high rainfall up in the mountains and the northern Central Valley. But then the southern Central Valley, you don't have much rainfall. And where all the people are, you know, Los Angeles, southern Central Valley, Bay Area, you don't have much rainfall. So how are you going to get all that rain from here um, down to your wasp moms down here? Good question. How, how do you? Well, 
we do that with with water. No, no, not this water down here. You want you want to use this water up here. But for that water to get there, we need some wet and wild <laughs> things in California. So a, cu a couple literature pieces I want to put here. So I'm going to come back to the 2017 wet season a lot in this episode, and that's because it was the second largest in history. Um, so this is Lake Oroville, which is mostly known right now for being something that East Coast news outlets take pictures of to make people feel bad about moving to California. Because at the minute, me at the in the meantime, it looks like just a t tiny pond. But this is what it looked like a few short years ago, and so high in fact that the spillway broke. Oh, yeah, that's a new it, problem. It's not supposed to be like that. Um, well, they were worried that if if they couldn't use the spillway anymore, it could overtop and destroy the dam, basically destroying the town of Oroville and a major reservoir. Which is better, who can say? But, you know, pretty much all the rain is going to happen in the months between December and March. And how that happens are these atmospheric rivers here. So, simply put, it's basically just a stream of water that comes up, not water, but clouds, come up through Hawaii onto the central host, sorry, coast, and then come on down, wet the Sierra Nevadas, wet the Central Valley, and something like this. This will, this will get to the most precipitation. Melts snow, stores it in reservoirs over the spring and summer, and then goes down this stream, hopefully not this stream, <laughs> um, to be enjoyed by almond farmers and people on meth. Yep. We'll get more into that on our next episode, which is all about that um, water policy there. That's a real sorry, shame. I thought it was going to be all about meth people. Sorry, the wet season. I'm sorry. I, I'm sick. That's my excuse. No worries. So, here's the thing. Water is inconsistent, and reservoirs can only do so much to stabilize that. So, we have these things called water rights, which is basically who gets the water. Now, the best way I could think of with um, how to explain water rights is elite school admission. <laughs> so it's the people that always get the water yeah that's right so you have so let's say you know plus or minus you have a certain amount of water every year and you're going to have pretty much the same amount of demand for that water per year now water rights were written up either when this land was originally settled like 200 years ago um, or the early 1900s, all some of the most wet times in recorded history. <laughs> so let's say I'm, I, I'm a legacy student, okay? And my parents settled on this land or went to this college. Why is, why is my coworker biking past my house? Hmm. How do you know where I live? You live pretty far out of the way, don't you? Kind of. That'll be a discussion in work. All right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's say I got a certain amount of school admission tickets right here, and I have my rowing team that I want to get. <laughs> my rowing team that I'm going to guarantee people to, even if they fail their SAT. Now, simply put, the water rights basically say you can withdraw this many acre feet from this stream at this time of year without getting fined. And there's this thing called the State Water Board, or the Admissions Council, that can, that can basically say, no, fuck you, you're not getting that water right to smaller players, because the larger players have precedent. And yep. there's water rights everywhere. Um, every major body of water has water rights, but it's a lot more complicated in areas where water is inconsistent and hard to get to. Yep. Generally, the older your property is, the more likely it is that you're going to be um, one of the people that gets water more common and, you know, more. That's right. Quantity. Um, but I... is it true that um, certain laws are grandfathered in? Yes. So that if you had a property before that law existed, you have no water rights on your, well, no water restrictions? Usually not. Um, you can't, you can't be gra grandfathered into 
using however much water you want because basically if water is scarce enough they can just change your water rights or say you can only get 50 percent of it um like with no warning oh and yeah the california state water council decides that and yeah but if you look at water use um about half of fresh water supplies need to be just allowed to flow outward because the land is meant not to have a farm on it <laughs> so most of the water the water is meant to basically come down to the sierra nevadas and go into the delta and just flow out that's what it always has done before people wanted to farm on it for some weird reason ted kaczynski <laughs> anyway so you need you need water to flow out because you know wetland restoration and of course you know if you just basically said we're damming uh the san francisco bay inlet not only would everything flood also like all the fish would die migratory patterns wouldn't make any sense so you gotta have outflow and this is what's this is where it starts to get tricky which is how much where do you draw the line between how much food you can grow and how much fish you can let live which answers the question is growing food wasting water <laughs> So that's kind of all I got to say for water rights. It gets super complicated. And at a certain point, it's not even fun to talk about anymore because it's just people like old farmers yelling at each other. But at least in California, with, of the 50% of fresh water supplies that are controlled by humans, about 70% of that's being used for farming. So take a place like Arizona where, you know, doesn't have a lot of water. But you don't really hear about much water issues there. That's because there's not many people farming in Arizona. So to that end, you don't have complicated water policy built around keeping farmers afloat. Yeah, California exists in this weird pattern of they want to farm. They don't really have facilities to farm in terms of water, really only in terms of climate. Yeah. So they're going to make it work. Yeah. And whether or not it really should. That's right. So, back to Lake Oroville I was showing you. Let's talk about some resin. What the? Oh, I forgot to take out these slides. <laughs> okay, so what is blank slide? So reservoirs. Um, there's a lot of them. So you got all these. And they're very strategically located at the bottoms of mountains. So you can still get a hydropower, but still have enough space to keep the water. And then it flows down all of these rivers, Sacramento River, and then the California Aqueduct, which is a whole separate episode. Um, basically, the California Aqueduct, between that and the Colorado River Aqueduct, it basically, all, that's where all of Southern California's water come from. <laughs> and they like pump it over a mountain. It's really funny. That sounds incredibly wasteful. Yeah, it uses, like, a lot, a lot, a lot of power. Like, that is, like, the main power use for Southern California. Well, although I suppose there's no such thing as wasteful if the alternative is not getting water. Um, I don't know. Like they say, is using food, is, is eating is, food is, wasting water? Is using water wasting water. Um, okay, so... We're going to focus on two kind of important, like really important reservoirs in Northern California, Shasta and Oroville. But starting with Lake Shasta, um, supplies water for the Sacramento River. This is where it is about. It's not Shasta. This is Lake Shasta. They're below each other. And then here's Redding down here. Um, Shasta Lake is um, in a position such that if Shasta Dam were to fail, it would basically completely level Redding. So they kind of need to live under that gun. But all of this literature is from um, calwater.gov. They're cool. You should listen to them. No, sorry. Read their website. But so this is its total storage capacity is 4,522,000 acre feet, which as we established was something like 350 something thousand gallons of water. So it can, it can hold a big drink, uh, so to speak. But... <laughs> So this is an interesting, uh, this is the I-5 as it goes over um, Lake Shasta. And you can see the water difference from June 2021 versus June 2019. So 
it's a little it's a little empty right now and it's about at 25 percent of its total capacity um, and then here's kind of a curve that it follows throughout the year so when the wet season starts around december it starts going up 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 um, when snowmelt starts happening and it plateaus in may as snowmelt's still happening but farmers are drawing water down it goes this year it's that same curve except kind of smushed yeah the uh the recovery period and the in the winter months might not be as big so it might long term not. effect and who yeah, knows what'll happen well the, the wet season they're kind of hard to predict in the future until they actually happen you can only really get a good idea of how fucked you are by the end of it because in march you can very easily get like three atmospheric rivers and just like completely have no worries about your water supply that year and basically it can happen with no warning but one indication is the uh, el nino and la nina um year which simply put is just how much wet is it going to get and the el nino system pushes storms north um which is not good for california and that has a higher percentage of happening this year than la nina um we shall see it's not really something you can predict this far off into the future. It's like some weird, it's like, it's like trying to predict how bad the winter is going to be. At least for us, like you can't really. It's, it's just, sometimes it's incredibly mild and all of a sudden there was a huge ass storm in February. Other times it's actually nothing. How it goes. But, and then the other one, Lake Oroville, um, you know, supplies the Feather River and the uh, San Joaquin Delta. So this is where it is. It's really big. Um, hey, this one was a great deal bigger. Yeah, the older one had a capacity of... What was it? Yeah, this one is large. It's got... As you can see, it's really not carrying much right now. <laughs> it's pretty empty. And this part, uh, the bridge... This bridge right here is right here just to get you oriented so this is kind of the main like the main area where the water is um that's still kind of full but here it's just like the water level is so much lower than it's surrounding so this is the picture that the east coast news outlets show they also show the um angle that there was a wildfire like here on the uh, like on the opposite side where the where the camera was where the camera is that scorched these trees here so they always like to show that with the reservoir but this graph's the same curve, same result now. There's some extra data here. So you have a, what, what a historically wet uh, curve looks like here. And then you have what a historically dry looks like here. Um, we're not doing too good compared to that curve right there. The yeah, it's curve. not doing too hot. It's not too hot, but we did get a better wet season than that year, so... We just apparently had more draw. Now, the main the main buzz with these um, reservoirs here is that they these dams they, they they aren't just letting water out. They're they're using hydropower. And hydropower makes up a significant portion of California's energy infrastructure. It's something that this summer allowed them to achieve ninety five percent renewables for the first time. Um, but. If the water if the water year is bad, you're not releasing as much water. There's not as much hydropower late in the season. Lake Oroville actually stopped producing hydropower for the rest of the season, just because they couldn't release enough water to uh, to keep the uh, res reservoir to a safe level. Huh. Interesting. Uh, we kind of did this already, but general Central Valley lore, if you will. So some of the most fertile farmland in the world it provides more than half of the fruits and vegetables and nuts grown in the united states um most of it is irrigated by reservoirs and canals but what someone commented in in one of our videos i did not it was a link to hot singles in your area oh boy i wonder where they are i have no idea who they are there's none in my area. I wonder where they're hiding. Yeah, where are they hiding? Um, but yeah, this is kind of how it's all irrigated. It's it's not enough rainfall to really make it happen. 
So they got these sprinklers here, which waste water and basically sink all of the land below it. <laughs> uh, but extends from Reading to Bakersfield, blah, blah, blah. We don't need to talk about that anymore. Let's talk about some scarcity. Okay, so this is what the drought monitor looked like this, uh, this day four years ago. <laughs> so it's the same time of year, it has nothing to do with it. But we showed the drought monitor before on the first episode, but I wanted to show you what the uh, criterion are for being in various categories. So this, the yellow, um, light yellow, um, I call it slightly dehydrated pea. So the soil's dry, you know, irrigation delivery is early, so that meaning that people start growing their crops earlier because they realize the water situation's a bit bad. And then, you know, the fire season's a bit worse than usual. And then people aren't really visiting winter resorts because there's not many trails open. Yeah. I mean, it's slightly dehydrated pea. Maybe you should work on it. Overall, short term, you're good. Yeah, it's it's not that bad. I also see none of that in California right now, so I think we're I think that means we're good, right? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah. So then, you know, go, going slightly to I don't know what this color, what what to compare it to? Do you? Um, peach color. Peach if you color. were Crayola in the '60s, flesh color. Did they call it that in the '60s? They they're the. Peach crayon used to be flesh crayon in like the sixties. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird. Um, it's like band aids. <laughs> I had no idea band aids were supposed to be skin color representative well, they until they them. came out with darker colored ones. They did. So yeah, and then we can read the one from Peach, but it's really just uh, P but worse. Yeah, and then uh, orange yeah. is. Orange is things are happening. Something is afoot. Something's afoot. You got long fire season. You got wine country. To what? Wine, wine country, country tourism increases. What? What does wine country tourism have to do with it? These these historically observed impacts are exclusive to California. So, oh, hmm, interesting. Um, yeah. Maybe that's like, correlation, not causation. Maybe it's like people aren't going to other resorts, so like they want to go to wine country. Yeah, I guess if ski resorts are the winter ones, wine country resorts are the summer ones. Yeah, interesting. So, and then kind of, kind of red, you know, you're in for some shit. You got livestock either needs to be sold, curtailed, or used with supplemental feed. Federal water, so that being water coming from the reservoirs, isn't adequate to meet irrigation contract. So farmers either need to drill wells or steal water or have their rights curtailed. Less dairy. Fire season lasts year-round. Yeah, that's what we've seen. There are kind of smaller fires going throughout the spring when there really shouldn't be any. Panning so, for gold increases. Panning for <laughs> gold increases? I didn't get that one either. Yeah. I thought that um, if water scarce... Actually, I suppose you don't want to pan in a raging river. You yeah. want to do it in, like, a trickle. I guess so. And then, going down to uh, what I call kidney failure. This is... Yeah, this is... You're, you're already in the hospital from D3, and you're getting worse. I, I, I was keeping it with the color of P. Yeah. Might have to ditch the metaphor. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So at this point, basically, people either just aren't getting um, their water. If you're if you're a smaller carrier and you don't have as many rights, they basically just get taken away. And fire season, it's it's nuts. And then fish relocation. So when stream when salmon go to the ocean to spawn, like up here in the Klamath River, um, the river's so low that salmon can't go through it to get to the ocean. So people truck them down to the ocean. Um, and then, you know, you can't use hydropower as much, so uh, you're using more greenhouse gas ways to get energy. And then, you know, not as much skiing, whitewater rafting, stuff like that. Yeah. But, so how, how, how do we fix that? 
I think that if you're going to want to fix that, you should probably solve climate change. Well, you should probably take some of the erraticness out of your temperature. You you want you want to take some erraticness out of your temperature, but let's say you want to transform basically a environment that has water on the mountains and dumps it directly back into the ocean into a place that can support agriculture and industry. So then you got to keep the water. Yeah, you got to keep the water. You need yourself some water projects. So this is Shasta Dam that I was talking about earlier. This is Lake Berryasa, um, a.k.a. the famed um, Glory Hole Spillway. This is your daily dose of internet. Yeah, it, it was kind of everywhere on the internet back in 2017, because, you know, it was actually... It was, it was right next to the one food that doctors don't want to tell you about. <laughs> uh, banks hate this trick, but they can't stop you. <laughs> People born in Illinois between 59 and 50, <laughs> 61 can I, use this trick on their taxes. Uh, the baby boomers in Orland Park are getting free knee surgery with this. And the town, they always track your town, but it's always two towns off. Yeah. So, yeah, anyway, this is part of the California aqueduct, so... That that is part of the Central Valley Project, which is uh, Los Angeles, California, and Colorado River. That is in a couple episodes, I think. But basically, what you're doing is you're damming a mountain range such that the water piles up in the area that used to just be runoff, and then you can control where the water goes, and it just kind of stabilizes the water supply um, or transports it. So that's that's what you want. If you're I use get, the floodplain to drain the floodplain. That's right, yeah. So, you know, downsides, obviously, you know, having a canal like this that goes to the desert encourages a lot of evaporation. So you're losing a lot of water that way. Except covering them with solar panels. Oh. So that's, that's an idea that's starting to gain some traction in Sacramento, which is covering the California and Los Angeles aqueduct with solar panels. So you keep the water cool, so it doesn't evaporate as much, and you keep the solar panels cool, so they're more efficient. And it's already um, public land that really can't be used for anything else. So pretty much it wins all around with that one. Yeah, getting land for solar development, and wi especially wind development, it's is hard. difficult. It's The thing is, I have a relative that does that work, and... Like, a lot of their job is dealing with boomer farmers who have failed to produce a good soybean crop and are resorting to, like, selling out their beliefs for wind energy. Yeah, and, like, the thing is, like, the thing about, like, finding place to put solar panels in is usually, like, common sense. Like, the areas between highways. Yeah. Like, what else are you using that for? It's public land. Like, you can't use it for anything else. Did you know that those areas are not present on the East Coast? What is it? The, uh, in the Midwest, we have the little grass patches in between the, in between the highway. Utah the has, drop -off. The, the West has, has it too. The East doesn't. The East it's just doesn't. one of the, it's, um, they call them the Jersey barriers, the concrete barriers. Okay. That's all you have in between the shoulder of one way and the shoulder of the other. Yeah, we like our, um like medians so we can watch state like kind of chubby state troopers do like 50 mile an hour turns to catch some guy doing like two over the limit yeah and <laughs> i can't do that with those jersey barriers also did you know i've got a train fact for you oh let's hear it train good carvan two four amtrak trains the double level ones are not run on the east coast due to low bridge heights yeah, they use the different looking ones. They use the funny looking ones. The ones that go um, everywhere else are, are much cooler. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. The GE Genesis it looks so cool. You're losing me, but it sounds cool. Genesis. The GE Gen Look it up. Look it up. All right. It's the ones that pass by here all the time. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, that's classic Amtrak aesthetic. Oh, yeah, so it uses a monocoque shell. Uh, it's not it's not as funny as it sounds. It means the whole shell is one piece. It's lighter. Hmm. It's, it's cool. 
So now let's talk about actual politics. So let's start off with the, the, the first ideology, which is, which is that of uh, conservative reviews on water. I, I was able to find this documentary. I didn't watch it, but... Oh, we should watch it. We, we need to watch the great global warming swindle. But I kind of I kind of did these a bit inflammatory to anger some reactionaries. But it, you know, climate change denial is like part of it. But their main ideology is we shouldn't be releasing as much water to the natural environment because you know we're short on water. Let's stop releasing so much water like right into the ocean. So in their eyes, streams just dumping water into the ocean, even if it's part of a natural ecosystem, is a waste of water. It's like the it's like the kid whose house you're at ideology for video game controllers. It's their house and they get the controllers. It's their state and they get the water runoff. Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm always of the belief that the, the guest should get the nice controller because you know how to use the crappy controller. I'm of the belief you shouldn't be buying the bad controllers in the first place. Well, no, you shouldn't be owning like, like the, the crazy cat one or whatever it is. The, the, the old people who buy the off-brand controllers are like, I don't know, because you're not saving any money. Like they're usually just as expensive. Yeah. But, Unless they're like the Dual Shock PlayStation ones, which are like sixty dollars per controller. Yeah, I mean, at the, least with Joy Cons, you get two. PlayStations are kind of nutty, but so what's interesting is the Republican kind of ideology with water project which is you know let's we got we got all these this water runoff and everything let's build more dams to capture it and the the number one problem with that is that it just leads to higher demand it's like widening a freeway you have more supply you're just spending more money to get more demand so if all the farmers are like oh nice we got more reservoir capacity all of them are going to start planting almond trees trees because they're they're more profitable they they need a lot of water that you now have so building more infrastructure doesn't necessarily solve the problem yeah doesn't china have china has a section just before a toll booth that i believe is a 30 lane highway yeah and like it narrows to like two lanes or something yeah yeah that photo is like kind of nutty that's what they're doing around here they're widening a highway that like really won't fix anything Oh yeah, I live near there. That's yeah. the exit I always take, and I have to go past my house and take the exit past it and then turn around. They took the train tracks behind my house and, like, made a big old switch that moves the train tracks, like, ten feet to the right so they can build a new bridge where the old tracks were. That's, like, slightly <laughs> longer. And it's like, you're not solving any problems. You're just making, like my commute to night school like really treacherous and almost getting like <coughs> hit in the face with a big old semi truck Ugh, crosswinds are scary they are scary when you see like a truck like kind of tilting and they're like i know what i'm doing it's like the uh who's the person on top gear i want to say jeremy clarkson it's... he was driving an incredibly tall truck with like a oh, tree yeah, on the with the house on it he had a, a truck passed by him and he just started getting sucked into the crosswind that was great and he opened up <coughs> trying to get into the gas station and almost fell over <laughs> good so, stuff let's move into the other view on water <laughs> this will affect the trout population i think so obviously you know it not only are is the democrat focusing ideology focusing more on why why are we having so little rainfall and reduced snowpack to begin with and let's address that cause first so but in the short term you know reducing losses and less infrastructure so every link of the chain there was a proposal by governor jerry brown former governor of california to build kind of a tunnel underneath the san Joaquin delta to get water from the wetter northern central valley to the drier southern central valley and besides probably not fixing the problem and being abhorrently expensive um it, it wouldn't really help yeah that's it sounds a little optimistic to say let's just put the water somewhere else yeah, let's put the water somewhere else it'll be okay so 
but it's just kind of like we want to reduce losses less infrastructure you know kind of make the um well i lost my train of thought just reducing you know like the solar panel idea was saying earlier that's being pioneered by some democrats in california congress and yeah. you know more allocations to wetlands and fish populations wetlands in the short term they consume water but in the long term is once they're restored they actually hold water and then hold carbon so kind of reducing two problems at the same time yeah i don't know can you tell it's, us anything it's about, about optimization that? we've got a system that works right now although not really this system as it continues was... to work less and less we need to find other solutions yeah and the main issue was this system was made in the uh 18 and 1900s which was some of the wettest time in like recorded history uh, and like that just and that just being a natural cycle like not even including climate change so people say the baby boomers need to get out of politics while the silent generation is still controlling our water yeah the silent generation needs to get out of politics first <laughs> both of them need to go in the long run yeah but that's that's the skinny on just general climate change, but it, how it affects politicians is all well and good. Uh, well, I had to text someone back. So let's talk about the effects on farmers. So just kind of a general representation here. If you can't grow, if you don't have enough water, you can't grow enough food. That's just kind of how it goes. So in the south here, and then a bit in the north, as the 2011 to 2017 drought progressed, you're seeing more and more farmland just having to be left sitting. And then here, these are almond trees. And once farmers couldn't get enough allocation, they couldn't water the almond trees, almond trees died. <laughs> Pretty simple chain of events there. So in the short term, it causes reduced profit for farmers. In the long term, it's just higher unemployment. Um, higher poverty rates in cities like Fresno, uh, just generally not good things that regardless of either, what either the Democrats or Republicans are trying to argue with each other, it does affect real people. Yeah. And then it's... the effects on our cities and suburbs, which basically amounts to pretty much nothing more than this. Yeah, um, until we get into the, the red pea stage from earlier all we're gonna see is patchy ones yeah it's like maybe one in, uh one watering is, restriction the cynical side says that more people are in the cities so elected officials care more about them so they're not going to impose many restrictions on them but the logical side says you know they're not using the lion's share of the water so it's not really their their burden to uphold yeah and then Kind of lastly, talking about the effects on nature here. So although human-based water policy doesn't do that much to affect wildfires and everything, that's kind of more forest management, um, what it does affect is wetlands, which sometimes they're drained to either control an, uh, animal diseases in the area or because you need space for a reservoir or something like that. And then if any of these dams has the misfortune to fail, you can do stuff like this. If, yeah, that is not going to grow back anytime soon. Yeah, and then wetlands, you know, the, so if they're not in a healthy condition, like i.e. it being too hot because of climate change, they can, like, it basically is a cesspit for diseases. But we will talk more about that and kind of the wet season in general. We kind of glossed over it because we want to have future content on... The next episode being that of the California wet season. So we're going to be talking about resilient ridges and the Pineapple Express. Not this Pineapple, pineapple Express. Express. It's not that Pineapple Express. It's a different Pineapple Express. But no rocking with the Banana Publix. I'm repping Pineapple Express. But Banana Publix. Banana Publix sounds like a sketchy place to go to in Florida if you want groceries. Banana. Re Ooh, we actually learned about Banana Republics and Apes. Interesting. How they overthrew governments to gain more control in banana nanners. Uh, able climates. Well, we want nanners. I want we want nanners. nanners. We're willing I, to do I want nanners, and I don't care if a democratically elected socialist um, is going to get 
like killed by the CIA because of it. Did you know that the um? So everyone knows at this point that all Cavendish bananas are from the, the same genetic source, and that for all purposes they're genetically identical. But did you know that the theorized virus that would take them all out is actually here? <gasps> no. Yeah, it has been a big source of problem in the area it started, which is the Philippines, which is one of the big areas for banana farming, and it has made its way over to South America. Let me pull it up right now. What's going to happen? What's the nanner forecast? So, more or less, Tropical Race 4, also known as Panama Disease, has kind of just wrecked havoc on farms to the point where the best thing you can do is burn down that area of the farm and quarantine it. You're seeing a lot more of workers have to sanitize their hazmat suits going into that area. You know, ultimately it's impossible to contain the spread of something that's out in the wild, mm -hmm. but Will Panama disease. And start a uh, nanner pandemic <laughs> for the people. Yeah. Um, Panama disease is resistant to fungicides and... Well, I mean, it's not a fungus, but... Yeah, but <laughs> more or less, if you've ever seen a banana tree, which I doubt you have, but if you've been to, you know, plant places, they sometimes have them. They're not actually trees. They have what's called a pseudostem which is very tightly packed together leaves. It's the same thing that a lot of palm trees have. And Panama disease just makes them floppy. The whole tree will just become limp. So it doesn't actually kill it. It basically just kind of... Oh, it, it does kill it, but it, it makes it unable to have shape as well. Oh. That's it's... no good. Um, so stock up on manners now. Plant them in your backyard, put them in time capsules, do what you gotta do. The thing is, these things never leave, but neither does the presence of that virus in the soil. The grocery Michelle variety is never extinct, but it's what's called it's what's called commercially extinct, mm -hmm. which basically means that the thing that killed it is still present in the soil, and if grocery Michelle bananas were there, they would die instantly like if you really 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 wanted it to it and like you know made a terrarium you could have it but like it's not at all profitable or sustainable to do it like commercial. it's funny because if you grow them around here it's impossible to get it those viruses need a certain temperature to live we don't have that temperature so the I'll bananas can't live here either oh I um I own two banana trees and they are doing very well as a matter of fact. Can can I have one of your nanners when bananas go extinct? When the when the Cavendish goes extinct, I'm taking a few photos with mine just to flex. The real question is what's the what's the can't 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 Daddy Monsanto give us a, a GMO? The thing about plant genetic resources is that if you are going to be making them, you have to have some sort of, how do I describe it? It's, it's the factor of what's in it for me. Ultimately, mm. having bananas be like soybeans and corn, where you have to grow them with specialized genomes, and then those spread through the form of pollen to farms that aren't using Monsanto soybeans, which no. ends up becoming a real suit for copyright infringement that farmers go bankrupt over. That's a real thing. Yeah, it's like, yeah, Monsanto, not very good, especially since they merged with Bayer. It's just like, wow, I have, like, this company basically controlling if people get to eat or not. That's nice. Yeah, it's, if you ask me, and this is just my own opinion, subsidies are obsolete. That's right. In fact, they're going against what we really should be doing. Steak is not $9 a pound. Steak is not $15 a pound. Steak is not whatever it is. Because there's so many subsidies on steak that the government pays for your steak dinner. 
you need to show people the real price of these foods because they can have them. They just, you know, they've gotten used to incredibly available corn and soybeans and meats and dairy to the point that it's unsustainable. Yeah, and then, like, with food in general and kind of retooling the agricultural system as climate change develops is encouraging people to not eat those foods and whether it's decreasing subsidies or just flat out raising the price to kind of offset the higher cost of making them yeah um and then kind of just showing people that hey these foods like aren't really it and they're kind of bad but obviously people don't care about anyone other than themselves so people aren't going to stop doing eating meat out of the goodness of their hearts um yeah. oftentimes you just need to raise the price on things but the foods that are being heavily subsidized are also the ones that are leading to the most carbon emissions. Yeah. And, and That's a visible outcome. People are realizing what people are reaping what they've sowed. Ha 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 ha. And in general, I, I believe that there should be more diverse subsidies instead of like corn, soy, wheat, corn, soy, wheat, corn, soy, wheat, and just all those products being like made into things like ungodly things that they never should have been made into just because they're cheap to do so. And yeah. then high fructose corn syrup basically like making America 50 pounds heavier. Snack companies have been given two types of Play-Doh to play with and they are not in the mood for another color. They are not. They want to eat the, the they want to eat the salt cover, salt and flour Play-Doh that they already have and they don't want anything else. I think Play-Doh tastes about... kind of good though. Go to bed. I think that's just about all the time we have today. Come on down to the next episode, uh, California Wet Season was Late Riches and Pineapple Express. Any shout outs before we go? Uh, let's see. Hmm. I'm going to give none. I don't have any shout outs for this time, I don't, unfortunately. I don't, have, I don't have any shout outs either. I was hoping you had something. All right. I'll try to do this before again so I don't have to do it a day late and be tired and be sick. Ah. No worries. All right. Um, got to stop the recording first. Stay on the Zoom again. Um, yep. I forgot how to stop fucking... All right, I got to stop the share. Okay. There you go. And then I got to... I got to... Oh, oh, shit. I got to end the recording. <laughs>